This isn't my normal line of research on Timothy Leary, but um, <clears throat> some years ago I got fascinated with his uh, theory of the eight circuits of the brain, and I put together this little pamphlet with a, a summary of all his thoughts on that. But that led into <clears throat> a greater curiosity about some of his earlier ideas and also some of his later ideas. And so I, I, was, I thought to, yeah, just present his ideas over the, over the course of his life. Um, He's, he's more widely known in a political sense uh, because, of, of course, of the LSD and so on. And it's, I suppose, the, the important point to emphasise at the beginning is that the, there, is, there, there is this controversy, uh, which is a, a live controversy, about whether he was right or wrong uh, to uh, blow the whole thing wide open and start talking about LSD. And, of course, there were, there were people who were close to him at the time, uh, Huxley and so on, who said, and uh, Albert Hoffman, who said, no, no, this should all be, you know, done under controlled conditions and uh, responsibly, you know, and people sign up and they go to meditation centers and do it like that, uh, keeping it very, very much under control. And then his decision at the time, rightly or wrongly, I think rightly, personally, but anyway, was to blow this thing whole wide open, interviews everywhere and everywhere, revolution, revolution, you know, and everybody take psychedelics and free your mind and free, free yourself from the political constraints of society. And, of course, that led to um, <clears throat> extraordinary political difficulties uh, on, on his part, which I'll talk about a little bit. I'm not going to talk so much about his life, a br brief summary of his life, but we'll be going on to, uh, into his ideas. I think um, an important point, <clears throat> which is something I've been thinking about for a while, is that uh, are there, really this idea goes back to Vivek Ananda, going back to the end of the 19th century, this idea that there's a tension or a, a polarity or a binary between, on the one hand, spiritualism, and on the other hand, materialism. And Vivek Ananda was single-handedly famous for sort of propagating this idea of spiritual East and sort of material West. He came from a very, he, he toured India before he came to America and he was appalled by the poverty. He got to America and these, the huge buildings and the, all the fancy stuff and the gadgets and, you know, materialism there, but they haven't got spirituality. I think this is a, a very misleading binary personally. Um, uh, and I think really the tension is between, on the one hand, spirituality on one uh, pole and then you've got um, political world on the other, on the other end of the spectrum. And that is, I think, the, the, the tension, whether you're, you're pr more concerned with developing inner experience or you're more concerned with trying to change the world outside. And I would say that probably Timothy Leary's mistake, not a mistake, but I mean, what got him into trouble was um, starting off on the spiritual quest and then ending up political. And then the political side, when he, of course you go political, you start encountering all the political forces, which led to, led to of course, massive um, problems for, his, for himself in, in, in his middle life. So um, people probably are probably familiar with his, his, his biography, as it were, but I thought, I just, just in case you're not, it's a very well-known story. Um, there are... Um... Go, go, go. Uh-huh. Ah, thank you very much. So, yeah, let's just start working back forwards. Ah, oh, okay. Ah, uh, good. Okay, great. It's all working now. Yeah. So um, there are uh, uh, since uh, 1973. That was actually when that book was first written by Robert Anton Wilson. There have been numerous uh, biographies of Timothy Leary, and I'll just quickly show you some of the, the in historical order the biographies. Um, this was 1974, um, and then we had um, summary of his uh, writings by his archivist Michael Horowitz. Um, then we had after. <coughs> the um, observations and uh, comments by many of his friends and associates. Um, this was the probably the largest biography, Robert Greenfield, um, um, <clears throat> published in 2006. And then um, the same year, um, a very good biography by John Higgs. Um, this was uh, followed by this one, you know, Timothy Leary's trip through time. I've missed out um, Charles Sachs's book on 1963. That was another biography, biographical account, somebody who knew him very well. Uh, uh, Charles Sachs was an undergraduate with him, and then he went on to describe his uh, time with Leary. And then um, there was Johanna Harcourt Smith's um, 
uh, story of her relationship with Leary. There's a, you know, a film recently, uh, she was interviewed in a film. I just saw that by chance the other day, that film of her life. Um, and then more recently, this is 2018, two uh, biographies published. Um, one <clears throat> by um, uh, this uh, person who had access to the, this is Jennifer Ulrich, access to all the, uh, his private correspondence and letters and so on, all held by the New York Public Library. And so that's a sort of perspective from uh, uh, sort of his personal letters and so on. And, and then there was this one also, which is looking at the politics, much more at the politics side of things. And they've, uh, these, these authors have uh, uh, researched uh, various FBI and CIA documents and so on, and they do the, the great story on, on his political life. So <clears throat> these are the biographies. Um, if we look at his ideas, they, <clears throat> I think they can sort of more or less fit into these four, four categories. Um, and I'll talk about those just if, in case you're not familiar, just a very quick overview of his, his life story. Um, and a brief, because it's well known, but maybe people don't know much about his life. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, so, yeah, born in 1920, conventional upbringing, quite smart in school. Um, ended up in the Army Cadets. He had trouble there, uh, expelled for uh, misbehavior. Then um, an MA in psychology, then a PhD in psychology in Berkeley. And then he published um, <clears throat> in 1957, this is not the original copy, the uh, Interpersonal Diagnosis of, uh, of Personality. Um, that was a book that was published in 1957. It won the Psychology Book of the Year Award in 1958. So he was a respectable psychologist. Um, his wife died, she committed suicide. Uh, then he was a little short time in Spain, then he went to Harvard. Um, then um, at Harvard, um, he was, again, a, a standard professor of psychology. Um, famously, um, in, in 1960 in, in Mexico, he took uh, psilocybin mushrooms and also famously said, you know, I'd learned more in four hours about psychology than I have last, the last 15 years as a professional psychologist. Then, um, then very much interested in the um, effect of psychedelic compounds, um, I mean, psych psilocybin in the, uh, in the first stage, just uh, uh, using that a lot. And then two famous, uh, very famous uh, uh, um, studies of psilocybin. One, the Concord Prison Experiment, where they gave con prisoners, uh, went into the prison and took mushrooms to the prisoners. And then the Marsh Chapel Experiment, where the divinity students had psilocybin. This was followed by eventually LSD. And then that changed everything. He, he had such a profound experience uh, on that sort of, on, on that substance that um, he, everything started to unravel in a way. Uh, with the university. Then there was a controversy with the relationship between this, the, the professors who were running these studies with psilocybin and the students, and that's a whole story in itself covered by several people, um, which led to their expulsion, uh, that, sorry, his expulsion from, from Harvard, including Richard Alpert, his, his main uh, colleague in the university, and also Ralph Metzner, an under, uh, postgraduate student. They ended up at Millbrook for five years, upstate New York, that was raided several times. There were two marijuana arrests. Um, firstly, it was at the Mexican border, and that was a long court case that finally got resolved. And then there was another case for two roaches, which they found in, in, in uh, his car in California in Laguna Beach. This led to um, him being sentenced to a very long stretch in prison. And um, before he went to prison, famously, he also had to fill out a psychological test, which he partly designed himself, you know, to <laughs> admit it as a low-risk, low Category prisoner. Um, so nine months in, in uh, San Luis Obispo, in that open prison, he escaped um, up, a, up a telegraph pole along a wire, age 50, quite a feat, uh, escaped out of the prison. It was all set up with the weathermen. Uh, we heard them referred to earlier, and Eldridge Cleaver. So escaped from that prison, found himself in Algeria uh, with. Um, <coughs> Uh, the, the Black Panthers. Um, that didn't go well at all. Um, they had a very, very radical political agenda, the, the Black Panthers. And uh, and so he got mixed up with that revolutionary fervor. But of course, this infuriated the authorities even more. He wasn't just uh, propagating drugs, but he was also propagating revolution. And that was, that was an extremely dangerous thing to do when you start challenging the, the state like that. And he was all, he was a very famous person at the time, very well known. And so it added fuel to the fire, becoming mixed up with um, rev proper revolutionaries. From there, um, he, has, he managed to um, escape uh, to Switzerland uh, after a little spell in the Palestine Liberation 
organization in Lebanon, which didn't go well at all. Then Switzerland for a couple of years. And uh, but then he, he, because he'd escaped from prison and previous charges, um, he, he infuriated Nixon. And um, he was famously described also as the most dangerous man in America because of his views and his activities. That led to his um, uh, arrest initially in Switzerland, uh, but, and they wanted him extradited back to the States. But just after a month in prison, he came out of Switz uh, prison in Switzerland. Uh, then the authorities were after him, and they were watching, uh, and he nipped over the border to Austria, and from there to Beirut, and then to Afghanistan, and then Afghanistan. Upon landing in Afghanistan, um, he, was, he was with Joanna Harcourt Smith at, at the time, and they took his passports away, and they sent him back to America, at gunpoint, as it were, and then he was put in the black hole of the black hole of the black hole in Folsom Prison, and um, he was in solitary confinement for 19 months. He was in 29 different prisons. They held him in chains for the first few weeks in solitary confinement um, in, in Folsom. And, um, and, and very, very extreme psychological torture uh, in that way. He wasn't allowed to read or write. And then finally, after 40, 39, 40 months in prison, he came out in 1976 and uh, sort of reinvented himself. And so that's the sort of biography. And then he went on to die of prostate cancer in 96, at the age of uh, 76. So that was his, his sort of brief biography. I mean, it's lot, a lot more to tell. I mean, it's a huge number of publications and all this, and lots of interesting uh, details in certainly the history of the times and the people he's connected with and all that sort of stuff. But today, I would say, in the brief period remaining, just to look at something at some of his ideas. Um, the thing that struck me looking at his ideas is consistently that he, it seemed to me he was about 50, 50 years ahead of his time in all the sort of fields he, he, he went into. Um, in, when he, um, <clears throat> he went to, uh, as a, a straight psychologist, uh, the, the personal diagnosis of poly, uh, personality, which I read recently, um, it, I was struck also by certain features of the, of the, of the, <clears throat> of the work. Um, the first thing to say, I suppose, about his uh, psychological uh, journey, when he was um, the... Uh, administrator of the Kaiser Foundation uh, uh, Hospital in, 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 for a couple of years in Oakland, in California. But um, then at the time, we're talking about the mid-50s, it was behaviorism. Uh, and in the background, you've got Freud and Jung and all these people. But it's very much looking at, uh, he talked about the patholo you know, pathologizing uh, the um, uh, mental illness in that way, that, that, that um, <clears throat> Jung and Freud, it's almost like a, a science of pathology, you know, like what's wrong with the person, you know. Um, and also very much centered on the individual. And he, he, his point in, in all this is that you can't understand the, the personality of the person or what personality is without considering in the context of other people. Um, a behaviorist is just looking at how the individual reacts to their environment. There's various stimuli, various drive, and so on. But um, this is all in, completely internally driven in the same way that Freud and Jung, they're looking at the internal drivers of personality rather than seeing personality as a result of interaction with other people. That's how you acquire a personality, and that's what your personality is. So he developed these, um, this inter 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 interpersonal diagnosis of personality chart. Obviously, it'd take a long time to go into all the details, but what, what, what he is talking about is he categorized, uh, him and his team, like 112 features of personality, various traits. And then these, with these traits, you, when you look at the, the, the person's score chart with these various traits, then you look at the interaction of that person with another person, then you start to understand uh, the personal dynamics that are going on within, that, with, within the individual. You can't understand what's going on in the individual without understanding the relationship they have with other people. So again, in this, in this is in the mid fifties, he's talking about family constellations, for example, and the importance of the, uh, the relationships with your family. I mean, family constellations is a big thing now, but this is in the 1950s he was talking about this. And again, inter, uh, in, in the, the um, process of interaction, very much at the forefront of psychology these days, the way people, their relationships with people are being discussed much more than the individual's pathology. So, in this chart, he has these various zones, as you can see there, and then, and without going into all the details, and, and then a person's personality at the time can be mapped on these diagrams, and another person's chart, if you like, their chart there, but can be mapped. And then when you look at the in interface of these two um, charts, then you see what the personal dynamic is. He was also very much against the idea that there are doctors and patients, 
um, in, in, that, that the doctors are in sort of one camp, the patient is in another camp. And he famously, in some of the um, when he was treating some or the, when some people were in the hospital for treatment, um, he would invite the um, surreptitiously the patients into the consultation between the doctors uh, as to see what they were saying, and as a voice, uh, you know, a voice within the uh, the group. But the doctors didn't realize that the patient was actually uh, in the room at the time. So they were, <laughs> this is the way of, of getting over this idea that there are doctors and patients who've got the cures. It is the interrelationship between people which are the key to the whole thing. So this was his work as a, a psychologist, very briefly. And there we see also this, I was talking about these <clears throat> personality types and how they fit on these, these charts. And this is, this is a... This is what the scheme that they invented. And this was his model of uh, personality. Here we have these, uh, all these different traits and how they fit into the, um, you can see the way, what the people say uh, and their various personality traits, how it fits into this interpersonal scheme. Um, so famously after the experience with mushrooms, that sort of, if we go back and the, whoops, we go back the, 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 from 1960 to 1963. This is when he was in Harvard doing the psychedelic experiments. Time goes by so quickly. It's incredible. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, then um, after, the, uh, after the psychedelic, particularly the acid experience, um, in fact, Ram Dassey told me one time, he said, he said after he took the acid, he, he didn't speak for five days afterwards. <laughs> it was, it was, uh, yeah. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> then... Um, the, um, I mentioned the, the prison episode. Before all that, uh, um, the, there were the publications. This is a very famous publication. There's a um, publication on psychedelic experience. Um, psychedelic prayers composed in, the, in, the, uh, in Almora up on Cranks Ridge there. Um, famously, The Politics of Ecstasy. And then his, many of his works were um, semi-autobiographical including his accounts in High Priest, Jail Notes, that was when he was the, the first time in jail. Um, that was the arrest, 1973, brought back from Afghanistan. Uh, then he was very interested in Comet Kuhutek, uh, 1973, we're in the anniversary of all that, 50, exactly 50 years later. This was written in Switzerland uh, when he was uh, uh, on the run in Switzerland. Then, um, interesting, then we come to what I think is a, a, very, a very interesting phase. He went to prison, and then <clears throat> in prison, um, he, he actually wrote uh, most of five books. The first was Neurologic, which is this thing, which dis and there are his prison notes on prison paper. Uh, Michael Horowitz kindly sent me those things. So he, he's sketching out these ideas in prison for his, for his theory of the mind. And <clears throat> here we have these seven levels of, 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 of um, consciousness. It becomes eight in when we get to the eight circuits of the brain, but um, actually the eight, number eight, is just a sort of, it's all a bit confused what goes on numbers, number seven and number eight, but the rest is consistent. Um, this period of uh, developing this eight circuits of the brain coincided with his ideas about space migration and so on. And this is, this is very interesting stuff for me. Um, it goes back to, to um, Francis Crick in 1980, the idea of panspermia that um, Francis Crick famously, along with Watson, they discovered the DNA double helix. Um, but uh, Crick upset the scientific community in 1980, saying that he thought that DNA, it was impossible that the self-replicating molecule DNA just spontaneously happened on Earth. Um, he believed that it arrived in Earth, on Earth, from outer space to another place. And as Leary says, um, it's ridiculous, the idea that there's only this tiny little speck in the universe where there's life. Self-replicating molecules are rare. There are a few that do it. I mean, famously, crystals, they self-replicate. Um, apparently, formaldehyde and cyanide in space under certain conditions uh, self-replicate. And also various proteins self-replicate. But the DNA molecule is um, far more sophisticated than those other molecules, and it does self-replicate. And it's um, if you look in any standard account of uh, biology, like Dawkins or anybody, you know, there's always this. There is often a, a paragraph slipped in at the beginning saying, "Oh, and there was the self-replicating molecule." You know, that started it all. Well, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, all the rest is great, but what about that self-replicating? Well, how did that happen? So, as far as Leary is concerned, the DNA molecule is intelligence, and that what the, what the purpose of this thing is is it, it finds a womb planet. Um, it goes through all these stages of evolution. What our purpose is, ultimately, as humans, 
is to be able to take DNA off to another planet and continue, continue life. In the grand scheme of the universe, the, the light span of life on Earth is extraordinarily short. So that's what we're up to. We, we are actually, <clears throat> with genetic knowledge and space travel, we will eventually <clears throat> um, be able to plant life on another planet. Now, these are the books written in prison, the, that then, and the, the eight circuits of the brain, it starts, it appears in, the, it appears in here, it appears here. Exopsychology has a, the, the first, like, full account of it, which is a, a very important book for me, actually, that uh, when I read that when it was published, it was a turning point when I realized here's an alternative explanation for the, the, the purpose of, uh, the, the origins and purpose of life, if you like. Um, this... Um, the, this is the republished version with his famous acronym, SMILE, Space Migration, Intelligence Increase, and Life Extension. Um, then these are the other, other get, that book has, The Game of Life has also not only the eight circuits, the brain, but all the occult correspondences, first suggested and apparently by Lama Govinda in India in 1966. And then there were various other ones, comics and so on, because we're going to run out of time. Um, now, a few leery quotations there. I'll just leave that there for a bit without reading them out. Um, now, the eight circuits of the brain. Let's, let's actually, we've been running out of time. Um, okay, five minutes, good. I, 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 I'm, I'm going to go quickly through this. Eight circuits of the brain. Now, I think this is very interesting. I mean, I think it's, it's inter one of the interesting ideas is to, first of all, consider the idea of DNA as consciousness in a sense, um, this special rep self-replicating molecule, which maybe, well, I think almost certainly come from somewhere else, either planted on Earth by, that's the wild stuff, extraterrestrial intelligence, we won't go there, possibly, who knows, <laughs> or just from a meteorite that crashes on Earth and the right place. Eight circuits of the brain, we have essentially this hierarchical structure of mental functioning. I think this is interesting because we know about neurotransmitters and we know, you know, there's acetylcholine and there's dopamine and serotonin, GABA and so on and so on and so on. This, this, this complex mix of, of, of chemicals in the brain, the neurotransmitters, I believe what he's on about, and actually you get also a similar idea in, um, if we look at, um, for example, chakras in, in the um, Asian tradition, First of all, it's not a consistent scheme of chakras. It's very different in different texts. It's four, five, seven, nine, whatever. But we're talking about a hierarchy of mental functioning. And um, when we go back to Timothy Leary's ideas on this, it's a very similar kind of idea. The idea that we have, <clears throat> first of all, circuit, we have circuits of the brain where I would say that we have different neurotransmitters uh, dominant or more active at that, that phase. And each... Um, in the terms of evolution of consciousness, we start with the, the, the primitive um, forwards, back, forwards, backwards, retreat, um, survival circuit, if you like. Um, then we have um, the mammalian up-down circuit. We have then the symbol, symbol manipulation circuit, hands, speech, uh, tools, and so on. Above that, we have um, social and sexual organization. And then the, the, the five to eight circuits are extraterrestrial in the sense that these are the circuits that are um, equipping us for space migration and, and, and intelligence outside, outside the Earth. So these circuits, <clears throat> four, one to four terrestrial, five to eight are extraterrestrial, tri they're famously triggered, these circuits are all triggered by what you consume in terms of a psychoactive chemical, whatever, so we get cannabis triggering the sensory somatic level where we are outside social norms, if you like, body as time ship something for enjoyment, and then we have a deeper level of trance, if you like, triggered by LSD and so on, where we have this, you see number six there, neurophysical ecstasy, neurogenetic, this is where we merge with DNA, and finally that's a big, we merge with the white light of the galaxy, whatever that is. But I think the interesting thing is this idea of a hierarchy of mental functioning, and I say it's very similar to, he didn't study a Tantra or anything like that, but it's very, very similar sorts of ideas in those things. So um, I think there is something to be discovered in the relation, in, in looking at the way neurotransmitters work and this hierarchical organization of mental functioning, where, I mean, if at, at lower level drives will always interrupt um, high level functioning should that situation arise. So whatever you're doing, if a crocodile appears, you stop, you know, <laughs> that's a lower level of mental functioning kicking in, you know, and, um, and, and also you might be having a nice time uh, 
uh, uh, chatting away socially, but then if there's a sort of sexual thing going on, that that will be um, uh, your, your attention will be diverted away from higher functioning to a, an, a, another kind of drive. So, um, well, no time. <laughs> anyway, um, that's just a very brief interview, a brief overview of, of um, his his some of his ideas on the eight circuit for the brain. And um, I love this final comment when nearly when, when he uh, right at the end. It's a million people I turned on. <laughs> anyway, so.